Hi, so today we're going to be calculating a complex integral. And well, this is the integral we're going to be calculating uh, the integral along c of e to the c over c squared plus 2c. And the contour or uh, curve we're going to be integrating it along is uh, this curve. Well, it's just the set of points, c belong to complex numbers, such that the modulus is equal to 1. And well, as we know, this is just a circumference of radius 1 centered at the origin. Uh, well, um, of course, an obvious question is what is the sense we are going to be calculating this integral, and we're going to choose the counterclockwise orientation, the positively oriented curve. Okay, and um, well, how are we going to do it? <clears throat> um, well, you could uh, think that we could uh, use a parameterization of this curve because it's not too hard a parameterization. Nevertheless, the integral you end up with is not uh, easy to do. In fact, I have checked and I don't think it has an antiderivative. So <clears throat> that's not how we're going to be doing it. And usually in complex analysis, we will get interest like this many times. And to actually evaluate them, what we have to do is to go to uh, the wonderful Cauchy's residue theorem. And that's what we're going to be doing today. Of course, I, I will be doing the parameterization and you will see how hard the intro actually looks. Uh, well, it's not a monstrous expression, but it is, it's, it's not actually doable. So, well, let's just see this. Uh, well, let's just do a quick introduction about Cauchy's residue theorem, and then we'll get on with uh, the actual integral. Well, Cauchy's residue theorem tells us that if we integrate a function, a complex function, along some closed path gamma, and this closed path, uh, let me just uh, draw it, is the complex plane, uh, the real axis and the imaginary axis, Sorry. Well, uh, let's just say that we have some curve like this, some smooth curve, and well, uh, we're going to call this curve gamma, and it is positively oriented. That's what these arrows here mean, that they are positively oriented. So how are we going to calculate this? Well, uh, Cauchy's residue theorem tells us that this integral is nothing but 2 pi i times the residue of our function at each of these points. Really, this is the sum of the residues of the function at each of these points. But what are these points? These are the isolated singular points of our function in that region. And well, you have this closed contour, the our region D is going to be the inside of this contour. Okay? And the point C i are going to be points inside which we will uh, which will look something like some holes, some pokes inside of the of the region. And what these holes mean is that, well, the function is not really analytic at that point. So there are conflict points. Uh, well, we just have to calculate the residue at those points, which we call CI. Um, well, before we get into how to actually calculate residues, let's just distinguish three kinds of isolated singular points. Cauchy's residue theorem actually is valid for all of these three points, but the most we will get, uh, usually uh, the most common points, are going to be poles. Ah, well, uh, isolated singular points can either be poles, which are points at which, well, if we take the limit, when uh, c goes to a point of our function, the function is close to infinity. And this is what we will call poles. And poles actually have orders. Uh, they can be further one, two, three, for example. Uh, a really simple case is this one, where well, the function goes to positive infinity at c equals zero, and it actually goes to positive infinity at that point twice because this is nothing but c times c, so it goes to zero for this c and for this c. This is kind of a not to read this matter to describe, uh, describe it, but well, we will say that in these cases the order is two, in cases like this <coughs> uh, the order is three, and so on, so on, so on. So, <coughs> I keep dropping things, sorry. So, this is what a pole is. An evitable uh, singular point is a point at which, well, if we take the limit, the limit actually exists. Uh, so it, does, it shouldn't create too much of an issue. And an essential singular point is a point at which the limit doesn't exist. So it could be some, somewhat more of an issue, but as I said, we are usually not going to be dealing with these two kinds of points. If you want to know more about them and everything, I will be making a complex analysis course 
in which I will explain everything into more detail, the right formulas, the proof theorems, and everything. But for now, let's just use the results and try to solve the problem. Well, of course, before uh, going to the actual problem, uh, what, what is the residue of a function? Well, the residue uh, of a function at ci, where ci is a pole of order m, is just, well, given by this formula. 1 over n minus 1 factorial times the limit when c goes to that conflict point, c0, uh, of the nth minus 1 derivative, right, n minus 1 uh, derivative of c minus c0 raised to the nth power times our function. And usually this term here just cancels out the singularity so that we can actually take the limit without too much um, issues. But, well, yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much for it, and as I said, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, just going to explain it real fast and get on with the problem. So, well, uh, in our case, <coughs> our function, f of c, uh, is going to be the interim, of course, e to the c, and, well, uh, c squared plus 2c. And a nice way to write this in order to identify poles is to write it like this. So we see really there are two points where the function is not analytic. Um, it is c equals 0 because it goes to positive infinity and c equals negative 2 equals to positive infinity 2. So uh, let's just check this. Well, the limit when c goes to 0 of our function, well, of course, this is 1, this is uh, 2, and this is 0, so 1 over 0 is just positive infinity. And the limit when c goes to negative 2 of our function, uh, again, negative 2, this is 0, this is uh, negative 2, e to the negative 2, this just goes to positive infinity. So we have uh, two poles, really. One pole at the center, and I'm actually going to uh, do this, I don't know why I did this here, it's so little space, I'm going to do it uh, bigger. So, we have our complex plane here, the real part of C and the imaginary part of C. And what we have our integration control, C in the uh, counterclockwise direction. Where are the poles? Well, one is at C equals zero. Well, of course, this is just right here. And another one is at C equals uh, negative two which would be right about here, negative 2. Because, of course, this is a, uh, sorry, a circumference of radius 1. Notice that <coughs> Cauchy's residue theorem only talks about isolated singular points inside our control of integration. In our case, the inside region is all of this. Notice that, well, negative 2 is outside this uh, region, right, because its modulus is greater than 1, its distance to the origin is 2, so it's outside, and well, <clears throat> we only have one point there. So really, we don't care about this, but rather we care about uh, c equals 0. So let me just uh, write this here. i is equal to 2 pi i times the residue of our function, f of c, at c equals 0. I just remember that I define i as the integral, so I don't have to write it again. And uh, well, <clears throat> what is it? Well, it's just calculated. Uh, this is just 2 pi i times, well, 1 over n minus 1. As I said, <clears throat> m in this case is 1 because uh, our zero, our zero pole is raised to the first power. <clears throat> so m in this case is just 1. So let me just uh, write this here. m equals 1. In that case, we get 1 over, well, 1 minus 1 is just 0, 1 over 0 factorial is just 1, because 0 factorial, as we know, is just 1. And this uh, limit, when c goes to c0, c0 in our case is 0, so when c goes to 0, of uh, the n minus 1 derivative, right? But in our case, sorry, m is 1, so this is just 0, and this is just 0. <clears throat> and this operator really is, uh, and, and the identity operator is just 1. 
So we don't actually have a derivative, we just have c minus c naught, which in our case is zero, raised to the first power times f of c. Let me just write it here like this. Uh, well, as we define, uh, let me just write it down here and erase all of this. Well, we set up to pi i times the limit when c goes to zero of c times our f of c, which is just up there, e to the c times c, remember we factor out the c times c plus 2. And of course, uh, the c's cancel out and we get, well this is a 0, <coughs> 2 pi i times 1, e to the c is just 1, and this is 0, so we get 1 half, and our answer is pi i. So, the integral really calculated real fast and really easy with Cauchy's residual theorem is pi i. <clears throat> what would have happened if we were to calculate it using a parametrization? Well, we just find out and see that this uh, integral is not uh, user friendly, really. So, let me just uh, write this answer here i is pi i. How do we do it? Well, a parameterization is just describing the curve in terms of a parameter. How do we do this? Well, all we have to do is to say that well, c is a set of complex numbers c uh, equal to something, which is our parameterization, such that um, our conditions for the parameterization. How can we describe a circumference in a complex plane really easy? Well, if it has radius r, we just uh, write the radius here and write our complex phase, e to the i phi. e to the i phi describes a circumference going from uh, whatever angle uh, phi is. For example, if phi goes from 0 to pi halves, we will be describing this arc here, from 0 to pi halves. <coughs> r is the radius, in our case it's 1, so we don't even have to include the r, just write e, sorry, e to the i phi. And well, what is our parameter? Our parameter is phi, and it's going, it's a real parameter, and it's going from 0 to 2 pi. Why is it going from 0 to 2 pi? Well, 0 is right here. If we increase our angle, we will be going to pi halves, pi, 3 pi halves, and going back to 2 pi. So one for revolution is, uh, <coughs> in one for revolution, our parameter has to go from 0 to 2 pi radians. Uh, of course, but uh, to calculate an integral, we actually need what expression for the differential. And in our case, if we take the differential on both sides, dc is just, well, the derivative of this is just i to the i phi d phi. So now we have a, a real integral. Of course, there are uh, complex numbers here, but in essence, it's just a real integral. So we have that i goes from 0 to 2 pi of e to the c, but what is c? c is just e to the i phi over uh, c again, e to the i phi times e to the i phi plus 2 times our differential. And our differential in our case is i e to the i phi d phi. So uh, we get i e to the i phi uh, d phi. Sorry, let me just... Now, this cancels with this one, and we get the following integral. You go from 0 to 2 pi of e to the i phi of... Sorry, e raised to the e to the i phi, e to the... Uh, this... Um, e to the i phi plus 2. And how do you solve this integral? Well, analytically, uh, I don't see any easy way to do this. And in fact, I used a computer to try and, and come up with an antiderivative, and it uh, couldn't find one. So I'm assuming that this uh, function doesn't have a 
yes, it doesn't have an antiderivative in terms of elementary functions. Of course, if we uh, use some other special functions, such as the error function or the imaginary error function, we might be able to get some expression, but that's not what we're going to be doing today. <clears throat> what I wanted to show is that, well, this uh, integral is not too easy to, com to compute, and actually it's, I don't think even if it's dual analytically, so... <clears throat> Just notice that how fast and easy Cauchy's residual theorem was and how messy it can get if we get to a parameterization of functions which are not too easy. For example, this integral is not uh, an easy function to work with, with parameters. Uh, well, before anything, I just want to say that you could actually try to calculate this by doing some uh, <coughs> restrictions, not, not restrictions, but rather uh, some bounding, right? see if it's bounded from the top, from the front to the bottom, and maybe you can get to some result which actually gives you that this right here should be pi. Because where we have our i here, well, we know that it has to be pi. But <clears throat> I'll leave that uh, for you guys and just kind of finish the video now. But before we finish the video, uh, using Cauchy's residual theorem, we actually uh, get an expression for this integral. And we see that, well, if course has to be pi, we see that the integral going from zero uh, to two pi of e to the e to the i phi over e to the i phi plus two d phi has got to be pi. Okay, this integral has got to be pi uh, because uh, it's what we calculated using Cauchy's residual theorem. So that has to hold. Now uh, to prove that in uh, without using Cauchy's residual theorem. As I said, I'll leave it for you guys to do it. So, well, that's it for today. I hope you liked the video and leave a like. And if you want more, just subscribe to the channel. See ya!